from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this, this is George Reed. Well, hiya, George. What's troubling Floyd from England this time? Uh, Johnny, one of our clients, only quite frankly, he's far more than just a client. Oh? Uh-huh. Yes, his life is being threatened. Oh, George, you know I hate these bodyguard assignments. Uh, Every Johnny, time I handle one of them, it ends up with my own life being in danger. I fully realize yeah, that. Yeah, one of these days, my luck may run out. Oh, heaven forbid. Nonetheless, Johnny... If somebody needs protection, why don't you just call in the police? Well, there are certain confidential aspects of this case, but, well, if any sort of publicity can be avoided, uh, Johnny, yeah? if it can any way help to minimize the danger to yourself, I'll gladly go along with you on this one. You, you mean literally, physically go along with me? Yes. Well, now, George, that's not the way I usually like to work. I know, but as I told you, this involves a man who is more than just a client. Yeah? Just what does that mean? It's my brother, Johnny. My own brother. Oh. Okay, George. I'll be able to see you. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the twin trouble matter. Expense account item one, a dollar twenty for a taxi over to George Reed's office at Floyd's of England in downtown Hartford. I found him pacing the floor waiting for me. And needless to say, he didn't waste any time getting down to business. As I told you over the phone, Johnny, this matter involves my brother, my twin brother, Adam. Oh, you're a twin? Yes, we're identical in every way, except perhaps for our manner of speaking. Why is that? Well, you see, Adam completed his education at the University of Dublin, whereas I stayed on in England, then did postgraduate work over here. Oh, I see. About 18 years ago, Adam and his wife came here to the United States. Is he also with some branch of Floyd's of England? No, Johnny, Adam owns a small brokerage office down in Newark, New Jersey, lives in a nearby town called Upper Montclair. Say, tell me, has this business of his anything to do with the threat against his life? Everything, I'm afraid. Now, don't tell me he went around selling a lot of worthless stocks and bonds, and now somebody wants to get even with him. Of course not. Adam is a completely honest, reliable dealer in legitimate securities. Then what's the trouble? Well, you see, when he first arrived in this country, he traveled around quite a bit, not only sightseeing, but oh, looking for a good business connection. I guess. Right on the West Coast, he met two men. Shockley and Barron, independent stockbrokers. Uh-huh. They seemed to like him immediately, offered to take him in with them. Well, since his funds were beginning to run out, he jumped at the chance. Naturally. But, Johnny, it turned out that they were swindlers of the worst possible sort, dealing in completely worthless securities. Uh-oh. Yes. Because of his lack of familiarity with American manners and methods, it took Adam quite a while to catch on. But when he did... George, George, I'm way ahead of you. What? When he finally got wise to them, he called in the law. So they got sent up the river, including your poor misguided brother. And now... Yes, Johnny. It was Adam's information, his testimony, that brought the whole foul operation into the open. As a result, of course, his prison term was a relatively mild one. I didn't know there was such a thing. But now that the others are free, they're out to get him. At least the one named Shockley is. It's he who has contacted Adam with this impossible proposition. Uh When did he and Barron get out of the clink? About two weeks ago. I see. So what's the proposition Shockley has made your brother? Johnny, Adam has spent the past nine years, ever since he was released out there, building up this small brokerage office here in the East. Now he and his wife are finally beginning to reap the fruits of their labors. Children, two fine, upstanding kids are in college over in New York State. So? But if it were ever to become known that he once served a term in prison for participation in a stock swindle... Yeah, yeah, I know. It would kind of pull the rug right out from under him, wouldn't it? It would completely ruin him, Johnny. And it would probably kill his wife. What then? This nine years of struggle of trying to make up for that one mistake has been just as hard for her as it has for him. Right now, she happens to be in the hospital with a serious heart condition. Oh, I see. Is she the beneficiary of his insurance? Yes. She and then, of course, the children. All right. Now, what is this proposition that Shockley has made? He's demanded $75,000. Seventy. 
Wow. Yes. Unless Adam pays it in cash, in unmarked bills, Shockley will release to the papers, anonymously, of course. Well, he'll tell them all about Adam's unfortunate part in that stock-selling racket years ago. Yeah, which means that if Adam had a single customer left inside of a week, it'd be a miracle. Then Shockley says, after he's ruined him, he'll kill him. He'll what? Unless he pays this money, of course. He'll make it look like suicide. After all, under the circumstances... Well, you know the ruined businessman. Yeah, yeah, I do know. Sure, there'll be no reason for anyone to think it isn't suicide. Exactly. Wait a minute. That's the insurance angle, isn't it? Yes. If Adam's death is called suicide, his policy will be void. His wife and kids will get nothing. And if this man Shockley is as clever as Adam says he is, he'll do it in such a way that any court in the land will call it suicide. George, I... Well, I just can't believe it. And yet, I suppose... He's told Adam that he's already got away with this sort of thing once before. Before Adam knew it. But why doesn't he call in the police, the FBI, if this man already has a criminal record? No, no. Well, maybe the other one, Barron, is still working with him. No, Johnny, don't you see? Don't you see he doesn't dare? (sighs) Yeah, I I guess you're right. If he called in the cops, the publicity would be just as bad, just as ruinous to him as if Shockley were to shoot off his mouth at the papers. Yes, Johnny. If he goes to the police, he'll only bring his business crashing down on his own head. Yeah, yeah. George, your brother's in a pretty bad spot. No matter what he does, he loses. If he pays off, $75,000. But who knows whether that one payment would be the end? Well, of course it wouldn't. But if he doesn't, don't you see it means not only his business, his wife, his children, but his own life. I know, I know. If it were me, alone, a bachelor with nobody else to think about. But with Adam, Johnny, he couldn't do it. He might as well cut his own throat. So we'll have to do something about it. What, Johnny? What can we do? George, I wish I knew. It was obvious this was to be more of a personal affair than business, in spite of the insurance policy involved. So for once, I decided to forget padding out the old expense account. Okay, then. Item 2, 435, a tank full of gas for my own car. It was after business hours by the time we got down to Jersey, so instead of trying to catch Adam Reed in his office, George phoned ahead and we went directly to his home on Highland Avenue and up in Montclair. George stood beside me when the front door was open, and you know something? It was like looking at George in a mirror. Yes, can I... Sure. Even their clothes were alike. Hello, Adam. Yeah, these twins were certainly identical, except for the slight difference in their manner of speech. Adam, this is the man I told you about on the phone. The man I hope can somehow help you. Johnny Dollar. Yeah, how are you, Mr. Reed? And excuse me for staring. Oh, it's quite all right, daughter. Quite understandable. And please call me Adam, if you don't mind. Sure. But so help me, I've never seen two people look so much alike. You know something? Hmm. What, Johnny? What are you thinking? Oh, uh, just a wild, crazy idea, Adam. Uh, George, this perfect similarity might... No. Well, we'll see. Well, now, wait. Maybe you have an idea there. No, no. Look, George, forget all about it. Come on, let's go inside where we can talk about this thing. I'm in complete agreement, daughter, because we have no time to waste. If there's anything you can do about it. Why do you say that, Adam? I've heard from Shockley again. Oh, when? This morning, after the last time I talked to George. He called me at the office. I'm afraid I didn't get as much business done today as I might have liked. Uh, Then I left as early as I could. I went to the bank and called on my wife at the hospital. She's very seriously ill, sir. Yes, so I understand. I've not yet had the heart to tell her about this whole ungodly affair. And I can't say that I blame you. And yet, what difference would it make? Whatever happens, whatever this man does to me, it's bound to affect my poor... My darling... It's a terrible thing, darling. Now, this phone call today... Yes, yes. Shockley says that he's coming here tonight. Tonight? Yes. Uh Uh-oh, with my car out front. That's why I stopped at the bank today. He says he must have $10,000 as a sort of down payment, as evidence of my good faith. $10,000? Well, I say that he won't get it. Oh, now, wait a minute, George. No, Johnny. I tell you, I won't let Shockley get away with it. George, If he comes here tonight and demands that money, I'll kill him, rather than let Adam give him a single cent. Now, listen, will you? I told you, Johnny, with me, it doesn't mean a thing. But with Adam, his wife, his children... You think he'd come in here with my car out front? If he does, I want to be ready for him. Give me your gun, Johnny. Sure. This whole rotten thing has gone too far. I tell you that if I have to in order to stop it, I'll... No, Adam, wait. Is there an extension phone? In the next room, in the library. Good. But, Dollar, if it's Shockley and he hears you pick it up... He won't, if we do it right. Now, wait till I call to you, then pick it up immediately. I'll do the same on the other end. Yes, all right, Dollar. 
Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Now. Yes? Are you alone, Adam? I'm alone, Shockley. You haven't called in the police. You know as well as I do what that would mean. The publicity. I'm glad you realize that. But I don't trust you, Adam. What? So instead of my coming to your home, you're going to meet me. You've uh, got the 10,000 for me. I have. All right. Cedar Knoll, about seven miles north of here. Do you know the place? Yes. Cedar Knoll. There's a little shack on top of it, empty. Now get into your car. Your own car, Adam. I'll recognize it. Meet me there. Very well, Shockley. Now, just one thing. Yes? Just be sure that you're alone. Because if you're not, somebody's going to die, Adam. It won't be me. But if there's anybody with you, you understand, Adam. I understand. See the no. Well, Adam, it sounds as though your man Shockley is as clever as you seem to. So where's George? Dollar. He listened to the phone next to my ear. Yeah? As soon as Shockley named the meeting place, George took the gun out of my desk and left. He what? He's going up there to kill Shockley. Unless I can stop him, Adam. He's going up there to get murdered. Where is it, Adam? The Cedar Knoll, where Shockley will be. Here, Dollar. I can show you on a map. Here. It's 15 or 16 miles from here. Ah. Shockley said it was only about seven. Then he must have been somewhere along the way when he called. That means he'll get there long before George can. Yes. Uh, look now. Here it is on the map. Yeah, I see. Straight up 23 and west of Pompton Plains. Yes. All right. Now, George took your car. What kind is it? That little coupe I saw out in the street? That's it. Oh, fine. There are 10 million of them on the highway. All alike. What's the license number? Well, come on. I, well, I don't know. I, I don't remember it. Then, Adam, all I can do is try to get there before George does. Before he gets himself killed. Traffic was heavy. And I don't know why, but Highway 23 was lousy with police patrol cars. I wanted to stop one of them and tell him to come along with me. But this was one case where I couldn't. So instead, I drove within the speed limit, except for a cutoff above Mountain View, where I could open her up for a few miles before getting back on the highway. I probably bypassed George, as well as the highway traffic. But the important thing was for me to get there first. That's why I left 23 again, took the curving, narrow, but much shorter back road to Cedar Knoll. Finally, I could see the knoll, a sort of big mound, a high, barren hill. I could see the little building on top of it in silhouette against the moonlit sky. And I could see a car parked up there, a big sedan. So Shockley had arrived and was waiting there. At the bottom of the knoll, I pulled off to the side, cut the engine, doused the lights, and went the rest of the way on foot. As I slowly approached the shack, through a drawn window shade, I could see a light in it, waving around like a flashlight, and the shadow of a man. No waits. For a moment there, there were two of them, two shadows. That meant Shockley wasn't alone. And knowing they'd be well-armed, both of them killers. Well, this whole thing might not be so easy. Yet somehow I had to keep them from hurting George. Yeah, and from killing Adam. Slowly, cautiously, I edged over to their car. I slid down under it and went to work with my pocket knife on a small piece of tubing near one of the wheels. It was slow and awkward there in the dark under that low-hung car. But it was the one thing I knew the... It was George. And of all the times to pick with me sprawled out under that sedan, unable to even pull out my gun. This is all you'll take. Watson and shot. He's got a gun. Yes. And I'll kill both of you if I have to. Mr. Barron, this isn't Adam Reed. Sure he is. No, he talks differently. This is his twin. It's George. You're right, Shockley. And I'm here to put a stop to this nefarious scheme of yours. Well, listen to the fancy talk. Of course it isn't Adam, so it must be George. And George, my name... No, is... don't move. Just drop your guns, both of you. Mr. Barron... I'm afraid that Mr. Reed, that Mr. George Reed, has the advantage of us. Yeah? Well, listen. He shoots 
shoots at you, I get him. If he shoots at me, you get him. That's right. I'll kill at least one of you. So, uh, under the circumstances, I'm afraid there's only one thing we can do. Yeah? What? Hand over our guns to him. So, here you are. George! No! How you dirty I yanked myself out from under the car, and just in time to have George land right square on top of me. Before I could push him away and get to my feet, he was out like a light, and both shot me in his power on top of me. I never got off the ground. Wait, you had enough? You had enough, mister? Get away, Shark. Let me shoot him. No. But listen, we've got to get out of here. Those shots he got off. The cops will be coming up from the highway to see what they were. But don't you see if we leave him here? We've got to, but we're not leaving this state until we kill his brother. Come on. No. No, you wait. Yeah? You want some more? Never get away. Oh, no? Use that car. Kill yourself. Drop dead. Come on, Barry. No. Listen. Yeah. You listen. Oh. Come on, Barry. Okay, okay. Take the back road down the hill. Yeah, I'll just go fast. Oh. Are you... Are you okay, George? Yes, Johnny, I... I guess so. But they got away. They'll go down, they'll kill Adam. Yeah. They're not going anywhere, George. What? I cut the brake fluid line. They have no brakes... By the time they get rolling down that hill... Good heavens. No, George. They're not going anywhere. By the time the highway police got to the scene of the crash there on the back road, and of course that car exploded and burned, they had forgotten all about the gunshots, if they'd heard them at all. So George and I were able to leave by the main road unmolested. At the bottom of the hill, I picked up my own car without attracting attention. I suppose I'll have to make some sort of report to the police. But I don't see any reason why I should have to reveal the name of the man they were out to get. Do you? It's certainly too late to need anyone to bring charges against them. As for the expense account, so what's a couple of gallons of gas in so good a cause? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Before I do, I just want to say thanks to all you good people who write in to tell me how much you like the show. It may seem like a little thing to you, but it means a great deal to all of us. Believe me, I'll answer your letters just as fast as I can get around to them. But you'll just have to be patient if it takes a little time. Now, as for next week, well, I suggest you read The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Then, join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were G. Stanley Jones, Alan Reed, and Frank Driscoll. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. Frank Lovejoy stars in a hair-raising psychological thriller, A Friend of Daddy's, as suspense follows next on the CBS Radio Network.